everything. And I thought, but is this possible? It is. Uh-oh, guess what day it is? Guess what day it is? Huh? Anybody? Julie, hey, guess what day it is? Oh, come on, I know you can hear me. Mike, 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 what day is it, Mike? <laughs> Leslie, guess what today is? It's hump day. Woo -woo! Hold the date, March 1st, 2019. That's when social activist, journalist, and humanitarian Sean King will headline the University of Louisville celebration of the 46th annual Dr. Joseph McMillan Black Family Conference. You read about Sean King, you see him on TV, you hear him on the Tom Jordan Morning Show, you follow him on social media, always taking the knee against discrimination, brutality, and injustice. So Louisville, come see Sean King live at the 2019 celebration of the Black Family Conference. The theme of this year's one evening only event is Sankofa, celebrating our past and preparing for our future. For more information, call 502-852-6656 or visit louisville.edu slash cultural center slash BFC. Order tickets on Eventbrite, lecture only, $25. Lecture and an intimate dinner and discussion with Sean King, $100 each or $1,000 for a table of 10. See you there, March 1st, 6 p.m. at the Muhammad Ali Center, 144 North 6th Street, Louisville. Let's keep Dr. Mac's dream alive. shooting a video for church. Just let me give you some of the details. No, 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 you can just text it to me. By text? I'll, I'll come. But you can just share with me over the app or you can text it to me. I know, but I wanted to tell you. But right now, it just really isn't a good time. Okay. okay. All right. Mm -hmm. Bye now. All right. Bye-bye. Bye, Felicia. All right. Good luck. It was uh, Sharon. She wanted to tell me about bag weekend. <laughs> Here we right. go. Hello, St. Stephen. My name is Lanisha Porter, and I'm here with this week's Lanisha, edition of St. Stephen. When I called you, you told me you were here. I didn't know you were here. Sure. I, I don't know if I know how to send it by the app, so I wanted you to show me. It is so easy, even a caveman could do it. Mm. 
That's right. It's so easy even a caveman can do it. Hello I'm your virtual assistant for the SSC Live app and I'm here to encourage you to invite guests to St. Stephen on March 9th and 10th by using the app. Once you have the app downloaded on your phone or tablet go to the connect tab. In connect you will see the bag graphic. Simply press it in, that's all you have to do. You will see the share button pop up asking you how you want to share. Whether by email, text or Facebook. Just add your personal message and hit send. Thank you for using the SSC Live app. Now let's all have the best bag Sunday we've ever had. Bring a guest on March 9th and 10th. Hello and welcome to Hump Day Sunday School. If it's Wednesday, it's Hump Day. If it's Wednesday, then it's Sunday School time. And we're ready to deal with a great lesson. Our lesson is entitled, Never Alone. Now this is still taken from the series, Not a Fan. Let me tell you something interesting that just happened before we came on. Talking to one of the co-workers, and we were talking about, are you a fan or a follower? And through the conversation, I said, you sound like a fan and not a follower. And the answer was, I'm not sure that I can give up everything. And I thought, oh, do you know that's next week's lesson? To follow Christ, we are required to give up everything. And the answer was, I don't think I can do it. I can't do it. And I said, of course you can't do it. And we cannot do it, not on our own. How are we able to do it? And that's where the lesson comes in today. Because before Jesus left, he made a promise that he would send us a helper. Ooh, and I'm telling you, that right there is drop the mic and go to shouting time. Because we could not do it. I don't care how big your Bible is. I don't care how long you've been in church. I don't care how many times you come to Sunday school. I don't care about any of this. If he had not given us a helper, we could not make it. Now, you, there it is. We have to have the helper. And the helper is the Holy Spirit. In fact, so many times we just run past the Holy Spirit. We never talk about the Holy Spirit. Uh, I don't know if because in old school we used to say Holy Ghost, and I guess maybe we just kind of a little shy of that. But do you know that in the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit is mentioned 88 times, and in 23 books of the Old Testament. Now, in, in fact, but let me say this. Uh, when you read the Old Testament, sometimes it will say the Spirit of God. But when you come to the New Testament, the Holy Spirit is mentioned 264 times. In fact, it is mentioned over 60 times in just the Gospels. Then Acts speaks of the Spirit 57 times. In fact, in some of the Bibles you, you see, it's called the Acts of the Holy Spirit and the Epistles talks about the Holy Spirit 132 times. The Bible talks about it, but we don't. 
And this is something that we need to talk about is the Holy Spirit because that is our helper. Now, our lesson comes from John chapter 15, uh, verse 26. And I'm reading from the New King James Version. And Jesus is speaking. He says, but when the helper comes, whom I shall send to you from the Father, the spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will testify of me. And you also will bear witness because you have been with me from the beginning. And that's John chapter 15. Then John chapter 16, uh, starting at verse 5, he says, but now I go away to him who sent me. And none of you ask me, where are you going? Not because I have, but because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. And he's speaking of the Holy Spirit. And my sisters and brothers, that's why we entitled this Never Alone. The Spirit is with us. But let me say what the Spirit is not. The Spirit is not an it. The Spirit is real. The Spirit is a person. The Spirit is a he. And the Spirit is a helper. The Spirit is not some impersonal force. He's real. Now, growing up, I didn't know why I didn't particularly like the song. Because there was a song we used to sing in church, Something Within Me. And I thought, something? What's the something? And since I have studied, I do not like it because it is not something. It is the Spirit of God that lives in us. You see, when we came to Christ... We accepted him as our savior. We started a relationship with him. The spirit knocked on the door of our heart and came carrying luggage, a bag, his suitcase, if you please. And he did not come to visit. He came to live with us. And in the luggage, he bought spiritual gifts to help us to do what we have been called to do. Now, so it's a he. Now, in the Old Testament, we read about the spirit, but the spirit was reserved for maybe kings or prophets or for ordinary people to do extraordinary things. In other words, God would send his spirit to empower an individual. And once that job was done, or once that task was fulfilled, then the spirit was withdrawn. See, the spirit came upon Samson. That's how come he was able to tear, uh, uh, he fought the lion and ripped his jaws apart. But the spirit left. But now what Jesus is saying to the disciples here about the spirit coming. And let me say this in in uh, different translations. And you will see that in King James, he is called uh, the comforter uh, in the New Living Translation. He is called an advocate. Uh, in other words, the spirit is called by many different things in the New King James Version. He's called the helper. And that's why he comes along. It's a paraclete. That's where we get our term paralegal paraclete. He comes to stand right beside us. In other words, uh, you go to a court. You got a lawyer. You have uh, an attorney and he's called your mouthpiece. Well, the Holy Spirit is the one who will speak for us and even tell us what to say if we would just listen. So, but now what Jesus is saying to them, because I told you last week that Jesus was a radical. This is radical stuff. It isn't to us because we so far over on this side of Calvary until we think we know it all anyway. But this was radical. In other words, for the spirit 
to indwell each believer was unthinkable, unbelievable, unexplainable, and certainly unheard of. Nobody had ever heard of that. But when you accept Christ, the Spirit will come to you. Now, let me push the rewind button and go back just a little bit. Because we really need to study our scripture. I'm telling you, we do, we do, we do. I started out in John chapter 15. John chapter 14 is where we really love, you know, let not your heart be troubled, ye believe in God. We know a little bit about John chapter 13 because of the foot washing. You know, Jesus, he washes the feet of the disciples. And uh, then, you know, he come to Peter and Peter said, you can't wash my feet. And we, we, we love that. But we got to study. Oh, my God, we have to study. Because in, and I just need to take you back because I want you to understand what is really going on here. In chapter 14, Jesus begins to speak. We know he's in the shadow of the cross. But let me give you some interesting, some interesting stuff that would just make your day. See, in this day and age, we do things so different and we think it's always been done that way, but it hasn't. Jesus is about to leave. You know that the church is a she. And the church is called the bride. Now stay with me here. You got to stay with me. The church is a bride. Jesus is the bridegroom. Then an engagement was done in, let's say, several different steps. Uh, first of all, the father selected the bride for the groom. Now I'm going. I'm going. I'm going to get to the Holy Spirit. Don't leave until you get this. The father selected the bride for the groom. The groom uh, will go away to make preparations for the bride. Now, the, the announcement has been made. There is going to be a marriage, but the groom will leave because he has to make preparation for the bride. Where, where are we going to live? So he has to go and do that. How long he's going to be gone, it depends on how much needs to be done for preparation. But the groom has to do several things before he leaves. When he gets ready to slip the ring on the, on the bride or the fiancé or the woman's finger, there are several things he has to do. He has to pay a price. Woo, this is good. I'm telling y'all, this is getting good even to me. He has to pay a price. He makes a pledge and a promise to the bride. Now, so Jesus is getting ready to go away. The disciples who are sitting there represent the church who is the bride. So now Jesus is going to make a pledge to the bride, the church. And this is what he says when he says, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. Whoa, that's good stuff. To prepare a place for you. In other words, I'm not going to take my bride and we're going to wander around and live on the streets. No, I'm going to prepare a place for you. And, and, and he cannot say how long he's going to be gone. You remember, okay, Put a pen there. Go to Matthew chapter 25. You remember when he tells the parable of the ten virgins. He said the bridegroom leave and there are ten virgins, five are wise and five are foolish. What are they doing? They waiting for the bridegroom's return. They waiting for the bridegroom's return. And this is what Jesus is saying. So he's getting ready to leave. They have to wait for his return. 
Remember, I say he's got to pay a price and Jesus is about to pay the price because he is going to go out on Calvary and then he's going to pay the price for his bride. And, get, and who picked the bride for Jesus? God the Father. He's the one that said his son would marry the church. So now Jesus gets ready to leave. Now check this out. He gets ready to leave. Now, you know, I know that somebody always ready to move in on you if you're gone. So what does he do? He is going to send someone to look after the bride. And that person is called the best man. Now, you see, in our culture, the best man is supposed to show up, make sure that the groom is at the wedding on time, hold the ring, and, and, and throw the bachelor party. Eh, wrong answer for this. The best man is supposed to look after the bride while the bridegroom is gone. He's called the best man because he understands his role, and his role is to look after the bride. He is... He is the friend of the bridegroom, not the bride, but the bridegroom. And he's called the best man because he knows he is not the bridegroom and the bride belongs to the bridegroom. Woo! I'm telling you, y'all got to catch that. Y'all got to catch it. Otherwise, you don't understand the work of the Holy Spirit. And so who did Jesus leave to watch after his bride? The Holy Spirit. He the best man, and it is his job to look after us so that the church on her wedding day don't show up in a wrinkled, dirty dress. And so he's here for us, and that's why we, he said, I'm going to leave you a comforter, a helper, an advocate, who will, so we need to understand the Holy Spirit is real. He is real and he is our comforter. So this is how come it was unheard of because the Holy Spirit didn't stay, but we have the spirit. And because we have the spirit, you'd see what Jesus said um, in Acts chapter one. He said, he said, but when the spirit is come, you shall receive power, power. And so the spirit we need to understand is a person. And as a person, the spirit speaks, the spirit teaches, the spirit guides, the spirit hears, the spirit sees, the spirit can tell, and the spirit can forbid, the spirit intercedes. Oh, and that and that one's a great one right there. I just have to stop just for one moment and tell you all. Oh, in fact, the work of the spirit in interceding, we get troubled sometimes. We get our hearts are broken. We lose a loved one or whatever the situation may be. And we want to cry out to the father. But when we get ready to pray, we say, Lord, have mercy. And then all of a sudden we just begin to cry. Do you know what the spirit does? Because the spirit is at work there. The spirit will take your tears, your groaning and go up to the throne of God and say, now, here's what they crying about. Interprets what we need and present it to the father. Now, I don't know about you all, but I love that part that he intercedes on my behalf and even tell the father what I stand in need of. That's the work of the spirit. That's how come we entitled this lesson never alone, because once the spirit comes, he will not leave you nor forsake you. But now let me say this. He can be grieved. He can be insulted. Uh, you can lie to the spirit and you can resist the spirit. It is not to our advantage to do so, but yes, we, we can do that. But we need to understand that the spirit is the gift that Jesus promised. He said, if I don't go away, 
then. He, in fact, he said it's to your advantage because when Jesus was here, he had, and we, we need to understand, he, he, he did it himself. He was confined to a body because he identified with us and he could be only in one place at one time. But when the spirit comes, the spirit can be in you and me and others and aid all of us at the same time. So it's to our advantage that he did do this. So, so but what does the spirit do? And let, let me say, talk about the spirit gives you power. You remember, of course you do, the disciples. Now, uh, Jesus is talking in John chapter 14, 15, 16, uh, praising chapter 17 in John. But when he is in the Garden of Gethsemane and they come to take him away, what did the disciples do? They ran. They fled. Um, in fact, when Peter later, we discovered that Peter even denies him. But they all rejected him and ran from him. But in Acts, when they are in the upper room and they wait for the spirit, when the spirit comes, they have received power. And these ordinary men do extraordinary work like you have never seen before because they have the power of the spirit. Now, just let me just let me say this. This is my own personal testimony. I did not choose myself to teach. In fact, growing up in school, I sat in the back of the class, kept quiet, didn't want anybody to say anything or notice me. And you don't have to notice me today. But when it's time to teach, because see, I know I have been given the anointing of teaching. So when it's time to teach, I don't care where I am who it is, I know, oh, that gives me a just illustration. That's the spirit then. Just brought it to my remembrance the first time that I was really trying to teach. I was over uh, William Lewis. You may remember uh, Reverend William Lewis. He was the pastor at Cabe at that time. And he had invited me to come and teach at a church um, school of religion. And I had my little class. I was just so happy. And I had my little class, and we were right there in the, in the sanctuary by the door. And the nightly speaker walked in. And the nightly speaker just happened to be Charles Duncan. Now, everybody knows Charles Duncan is a teacher's teacher. So, but that was all right, and I, you know, I knew Reverend Duncan. I thought, wave my hand and gonna keep on teaching. But now, you know what he did? He stopped, sat down in my class, and I thought, no, he didn't. He didn't sit in my class. No. He's supposed to go to the pastor study because that's what they do. Why is he sitting here? Well, needless to say, it made me nervous. I thought, oh, Lord. So I was continuing to try to teach. And the Spirit spoke to me. And I turned my back to the class and said, what do you say? And the Spirit said to me, the same power that's in him is in you. And I said, the same power? The same power that's in him is in you. And I thought, that's unbelievable. I cannot teach like this man. The same power, there's not another. The same power that's in him is in you. And I thought, whoa! And I turned around. And um, I've been teaching ever since because the power, and I just thought if the power that's in him is in me, then I should be able to do what he does. And at the end of that school of religion, uh, Reverend Duncan, you know, complimented me on how well I taught. And that was what I needed. And I'm telling you this because you have the power, not another power. I don't have one kind of power. Pastor Cosby got another. Somebody else got another. Uh, uh, Dr. Bruce Williams. I, it's the same power in all of us. You just have to activate it. You have got to step out on it and use it. 
And so you have the power. Now, so let's look at the work of the Holy Spirit. The work of the Holy Spirit is to convince us. You see, preachers preach to convert, convince, and convert. And here's what, and comfort. And the Holy Spirit has to convince us because many of us think, well, that's all right, we can do this. He has to convince us of the fact of sin. And sin is a fact. We like to think that all, we call it a mistake. We say it's, uh, oh, I made an error, but sin is sin. And he has to convince us of the fact of sin. Now, and the fault of sin, the folly of sin. Cause see, sin is nothing to play with, but we just like to play around. Now, we, we shouldn't play with sin. Now I'm gonna say this, because many of us, we find Sin is fun. It's much more fun to walk the broad way and to have a good time and to go out and to kick up your heels. And, you know, you know what you all, what we used to do. I, I, I used to do it. I wasn't born with the testament in my hand. It was fun. But the scripture tells us the wedges of sin is death. And sin is nothing to play with. Sin, I, I, I got a few things here I want to show you what sin will do to you. Sin spars and it soars. Sin eats and it defeats. It chills and it kills. Sin nails and it fails. It rushes and it crushes. It itches and it switches. It hurts and it perverts. Sin sinks and it stinks. It stops and it drops. It, it dooms and it consumes. It chokes and it provokes. That is sin. And that's how come I was so glad that last year we did uh, sins we tolerate. Because there are some sins that we tolerate, but it is the Holy Spirit's job to convict and convince us of the filth and the folly of sin. Also, he convinces us of the fruit of sin. Now you might say, well, what fruit? Well, I'm glad you did, because I brought the Bible to read it to you. Galatians chapter 15, uh, verse um, 19, start at 19. Uh, let me see, start at 19, yeah. Uh, no wonder, I'm still reading in John. Galatians, go to the Galatians, Galatians chapter 5. And I was looking at John chapter 15, that's how come, there's no Galatians 15. I know that, you know that, but I'm looking down at John. Okay, Galatians chapter 5, and go to verse 19. And now it says this, when you follow the desires of your sinful nature, the results are very clear. We're talking about, you know, we love to talk about the fruit of the spirit, but there's also the fruit of sin. And here it is, sexual immorality, impurity, lustful pleasures, idolatry, sorcery, hostility, quarreling, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambition, dissension, division, envy, drunkenness, wild parties, orgies, and other sins like these. And that comes from sin. Read it. I didn't make it up. It's in your Bible unless you tore it out. It's Galatians chapter 5. Start with verse 19. And so that is the fruit of sin. And when you plant sinful habits, you will reap the harvest. All right. So the spirit com convicts us, convicts us. And let me tell you, it will also pay you because the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life. But here's also what the, what the Spirit will do. The Spirit will comfort us 
during our time of sorrow. Uh, and if you've ever had sorrow, I, I, well, let me put it this way. When I would think of my mother passing, oh, I could just, tears would just fall. But seven years ago, the Lord came and got my mother. And because of the power and the aid of the Holy Spirit, I was able to stand up at her funeral and say a word, memories of my mother. And I, and I, I used to cry just thinking about who mama's gone. But the Spirit came not only comfort me, but empowered me to be able to stand. The Spirit will help you in your sickness. Uh, many times you go and visit the sick and you end up coming back because they have cheered you up. How is that because of the power of the Spirit? In your suffering, the Spirit will aid us. Then, also not only in times of sorrow, sickness, and suffering, but also during our times of trials. The Spirit will help us during our times of trials, during our times of trouble. In fact, Jesus said, going back to John chapter 19, he said, these things I have told you because in this world you will have some troubles, but be of good cheer. Why, Jesus? Because I have overcome the world. And we have, as in fact, as I was teaching the other night, I said, you see, what we need to understand, this is a fixed fight we are in. And in a fixed fight, here it is, the outcome is already determined. So the outcome is already determined. In the end, we win. So, and so in, in John chapter 16, verse 33, these things I have spoken to you that in me, you may have peace in the world, the world, you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. And he does this. He empowers us. He gives us of the comfort that we need and the aid that we need because of his presence. He has said he will never leave us. Now, in fact, Deuteronomy uh, 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 chapter 31, verse 6. And this is important for us to know because God says it three times. Three times, and you know three is complete. So he says in Deuteronomy 31, 6. Be strong and of good courage. Do not fear, nor be afraid of them. Who's the them in your life? Whatever the them is, it could be on the job, it could be in the neighborhood, it could be in your home, it could be relationships, whatever it might be, it could be your dream. Do not be afraid of them, for the Lord your God, he is the one who goes with you, here it is, he will not leave you nor forsake you. Joshua chapter one, verse five. No man, this is from the Amplified, and sometimes Amplified, you know, they put it in parentheses so that you can really get the full impact. He says, no man, nothing shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. What are you afraid of? You have the power. You have the presence of the Holy Spirit with you. So he said, nothing shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, and this is God, this is God talking to Joshua. So, but you can put another name in there. As I was with your mama, as I was with your daddy, as I was with whoever's name you want to put, so I am with you. Here it is again. I will not leave you nor forsake you. Now, then he says it again. 
uh, in Hebrew chapter 13, verse 5. Again, I am going to read out of the uh, Amplified Bible. Here's what it said. Now, <clears throat> let your character, your moral essence, your inner, nation, uh, inner nature be free from the love of money. In other words, shun grief, be financially ethical, being content with what you have. For he said, Ooh, I will never. Remember, this is, this is the Amplified. So you will see in parentheses, I will never under any circumstances. Oh, that's good. Desert you, nor give you up, nor leave you without support, nor will I in any degree leave you helpless. Now, I don't know about y'all, but that's shouting territory to me. Nor will I forsake or let you down or relax my hold on you. Whoa. <laughs> y'all not getting this. Y'all not getting this. I'm not getting this. I'm going to read it again, just for my sake, if not for your house. I will never, under any circumstances, desert you, nor give you up, nor leave you without support, nor will I in any degree leave you helpless, nor will I forsake or let you down or relax my hold on you. Now, you remember when you was, you may not, but trust me, when you were learning to walk, your mama, your daddy, or your grandma, or somebody would hold your hand. And the thing was not only to help you, to give you the aid that you need, but even when you tried to get away, because many of us at times would try to get away, but they had a hold on you. And many times what I found is if you hold their hand, you can let go. But if they hold your hand, it don't matter. They're not going to let you go. And this is what God is saying to us now. I will not let go of your hand. So he takes our hand and he's not going to let go of our hand. You got to get this. See, if we took his hand, and I'm so glad that he got hold of my hand because there will be times, there have been times that I want to get away. It's kind of like something catches my eye over here and I look and I think, oh, that looks fun. And so I might go going that way. But no, no, the spirit of God said, no, 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 you can't do that. You know that that voice that speaks to us. Said, so, no, you cannot do that. So he gives us the spirit to help us to be followers of his. Because otherwise, my sisters and brothers, we could not do it. And fans who try and follow Jesus without this power will start to show signs. Sooner or later, they will reach a point where they are frustrated by failures. Or they are overwhelmed by life circumstances. They will find themselves discouraged and they will start to doubt. And so we need the aid of the spirit. In fact, fans eventually get burned out from trying to live the Christian life. And so what do they do? When they can't make it on their own efforts, then they stop altogether. So fans who depend on their own strength to follow Christ will soon find themselves drained and defeated. It's not easy when you got the spirit with you. So how much more difficult it becomes when we try to do it on our own? Because followers understand this, and you need to get this last word that I'm going to throw out here to you. Followers understand it's a journey, and it's a journey that we were never meant to walk it alone. 
We are not called to walk this journey alone. So having said that, I can't help but remember this song. It said, I've seen the lightning flashing. I've heard the thunder roar. I have felt sins breakers dashing, trying to conquer my soul. But I've heard the voice of Jesus telling me still fight on. Why? He promised never to leave me, never to leave me alone. No, never alone. No, never alone. He promised. And when G and a promise is only as good as the person who makes the promise. And Jesus promises you can take to the bank and cash it because it's good. It's not going to bounce. He promised never to leave me alone. Well, that's our lesson for to, today. And we'll be looking for you next week. But don't forget. Now, I do want to tell you this. Next week, because of the Western Forum, we will be coming on at 2 o'clock. But I invite you to tune in and catch the Western Forum. If you can be here, I would suggest that you be here because it is of great importance. You see, the church has more to do than just shout on its way to heaven. But we got to live while we're down here. So we, the Western Forum, uh, is going to be about our children in JCPS school. So tune in to us. Next week we'll be at two, but uh, come to the West End Farm. It will do you good. See you then. Simmons College of Kentucky presents the West Louisville Forum. This month's topic, the black student crisis at JCPS and the Simmons Solution. Special guest panelists include Jefferson County Public School Superintendent, Dr. Marty Polio, former Assistant Secretary of Education for the United States Department of Education, Dr. Sharon Porter Robinson, and President of Simmons College, Reverend Dr. Kevin W. Cosby. It's the West Louisville Forum, Wednesday, March 6th at noon. Lunch will be available for purchase beginning at 11. The West Louisville Forum, solutions for urban America.